Good morning. I am Rajiv Agrawal, if you don't know me, and uh, I will be the moderator for this next session, which is session five, Sex Differences in Gene Expression. Yesterday, we had outstanding talks, and we had outstanding poster session, and uh, we are going to continue the same tradition in this session also, and the first speaker is Dr. Scott Hullgreen from Washington University School of Medicine. His talk, UTI Complexity Results from Diversity at Bacterial Host Interface. I'm sorry to say because of uh, some medical emergency, he is not able to come, but Dr. David Hunstead is kind enough to present his slides. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Scott sends his regards. Uh, he's okay. Uh, so don't worry too much. Uh, but he's really sad that he couldn't um, join us today for this um, really what's been a great um, meeting full of uh, interesting advances in sex differences. Um, I want to say that one of the take homes that I had from yesterday was. Uh, what the impact of the sex and gender supplements from the Common Fund uh, has been really across all the fields that we that we saw yesterday. So thanks to Paul and the Common Fund for, for that. And Scott is the program director at our specialized center of research uh, on sex differences, uh, which is supported by the ORWH. Thank you, Janine. And uh, NIDDK. Um, and... I'm going to, this morning, share with you some things that are going on in Scott's lab um, in the field of urinary tract infection, focusing first on uh, the development of novel therapeutics. Um, and then in my actual talk, which is coming up next, uh, I'm going to talk to you about work we're doing uh, in sex differences. Um, so I'm not Scott. So for example, he was just inducted into the National Academy of Medicine, um, but at least I have more hair. So. Here we go. Um, Scott does want to disclose that he's part owner of Fimbrion Therapeutics. This is a company that he has started that is working on developing some of the small molecules that I'll talk about later in the talk. So um, I want to just set the stage in terms of chronic uh, infection management. Um, most of you inside and outside the field of infectious diseases know that antibiotic resistance is a problem. Um, unless you've been living in a cave, most people read CNN or the New York Times or whatever. We really are at a tipping point now where not only outside the United States, for sure, but now increasingly inside the United States, we're really starting to see patients where um, we don't have antibiotic options. I've personally taken care of children with infections where we have nothing to treat them with. And this is a really scary uh, place to be. Um, one of the things that has, has been a focus of Scott's lab is to translate basic science advances, once again, um, in the field of urinary tract infection, to really develop um, therapeutics directed at mechanisms of virulence and, um, and pathogenesis and not uh, traditional antibiotics, which put a lot of pressure on bugs uh, to develop resistance. UTIs are an interesting bacterial infection to study, um, 10 to 15 million cases a year. Uh, and the cost, depending on what you read, between 2 and $4 billion uh, to the United States. They can be um, very persistent. So there are chronic infections, but also many women suffer from recurrent um, infection of the bladder or cystitis. Uh, the bacteria are becoming more difficult to treat, more resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics. So in some cases, we really don't have good treatment options. Um, and then um, he's also studying catheter-associated UTI, which is a healthcare-associated infection that adds another billion, uh, at least, per year in healthcare costs. And these infections, both community-onset infections and hospital-onset infections, are caused predominantly by uropathogenic E. coli, which I'll talk, uh, talk to you about and I'll refer to as UPEC uh, through the talk. So um, UPEC and other bacteria use uh, a variety of surface adhesive fibers and molecules to stick to epithelial surfaces, which is usually the instigating event of an infectious disease. So here's a schematic of how that looks. Um, this is a big E. coli, if you will, uh, with these fibers that we call pili. Oh, you like the green one better? Uh, so uh, these fibers, um, called pili, uh, 
that have at their tips these adhesive proteins that bind to various receptors on the relevant epithelial surface. And this kind of model is important in all kinds of bacterial infections, uh, including a bunch um, listed here. And uh, with relevance to this talk, uh, urinary tract infection uh, is importantly driven by uh, attachment events that are mediated by pili like this. So here is a false colored uh, scanning EM uh, of E. coli and gold sitting on the bladder epithelial surface. Um, you can see they're covered with these sticky fibers. Uh, if you look close up at these things, these are type 1 pili, and they have at their tips a protein called FIMH. FIMH is an adhesin that binds to mannose, a sugar, that decorates uh, many proteins on the surface of the bladder epithelium. And so this interaction really uh, is the, once again, the instigating event in bacterial cystitis. Here's a close-up of what that interaction looks like. So this is the adhesin domain of the FIMH protein here in the space-filling model showing how mannose fits into this little binding pocket uh, right here. And this is going to be important structurally to understand when we start talking about how one could develop small molecules to inhibit this binding interaction. What's the result of this interaction? So um, E. coli shown again here in gold uh, binds to the superficial epithelial cells of the bladder and an internalization event then occurs where the bladder cell sort of zippers around uh, the, the bug and takes it in. Here's a different view of that. Once inside, these bacteria gain access to the cytoplasm of these superficial epithelial cells of the bladder and begin replicating within these cells forming these large, dense communities of bacteria that we call intracellular bacterial communities, or IBCs. And here's a scanning EM of a bladder uh, where this cell uh, is totally protruding into the lumen uh, because it basically has a giant ball of bacteria uh, inside of it. And this is schematized here, once again, binding, internalization. Some of these cells are actually exfoliated as part of a host response. Uh, but um, in the cytoplasm of other cells, these bacteria multiply. Uh, into these IBCs. Why are these IBCs important? So it turns out that, once again, this, this is a place where the bugs can replicate um, inside uh, and do this uh, while the immune system is marshalling its response. So the major cellular responder to UTI is the neutrophil. And so on the left here, I'm going to show you the top-down view of bacteria in an IBC. And the neutrophils false colored blue, which can locate this infected bladder epithelial cell but can't get inside to eat those bacteria. And then on the right here, I'm showing you some bacteria sitting on the surface of the bladder. Um, and even though the neutrophils are not false colored in this view, um, you will see that they are rapidly eaten by the neutrophils that come. And so this is a hiding place uh, where the bugs can um, replicate uh, inside host cells. I'm not going to belabor this busy slide, but what happens here then is you have attachment, internalization, intracellular replication, which we've just talked about, and formation of these IBCs. Following that, some bacteria flux out and form filaments, which are actually resistant to neutrophil phagocytosis, and they flux out over the surface and infect naive cells. After this cycle in the acute phase of infection, two results can occur in the mouse model. One is the formation of quiescent intracellular reservoirs which are bacteria sitting in the epithelium that may uh, persist for months, resist antibiotic therapy, and apparently are not detected by the immune system. And these may be the cause of recurrent cystitis in some women. Uh, alternatively, a chronic cystitis phenotype can occur where there's long-term, high titer, very inflammatory um, bacterial infection. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in my talk. So I just mentioned that um, recurrent UTI can be caused potentially by uh, bacteria that are chronically resident in the bladder. Um, the classic model of UTI recurrence is that E. coli are harbored in the gut, in the gastrointestinal tract, and that this is the source of uropathogenic bacteria. Um, and so Scott's lab has also been working on modeling this and understanding how uropathogens interact with the rest of the host microbiome uh, to then uh, persist in the gut and ultimately make it to the urinary tract. They've been working on a model that they call the lock and key model, where um, uh, a certain combination of factors from the host side and the bacterial side result in urinary tract infection. It's important to note that um, uropathogenic E. coli is not one strain of bacteria. If you take a bunch of uropathogenic strains of bacteria, which was done by Henry Schreiber in his lab, um, and look at their gene content, uh, 
only about 60 to 75 percent of those genes are the same. And across this panel of UPEC strains, up to 40% uh, of the genes are different. So there isn't one signature of a uropathogenic uh, E. coli strain. In their model, um, they think that the host and the bacteria um, each have a certain combination of factors that when the time is right and the synergy is right, a urinary tract infection uh, can result. So diverse habitats within the host, including the gut and the bladder and the kidney, um, represent the locks, whereas the UPEC strain have uh, a variety of keys. And a, a strain that may cause a urinary tract infection in one woman uh, may not cause a urinary tract uh, infection in another woman. But instead, colonization and persistence in the gut and perhaps uh, in the urinary tract uh, occurs when a lock is uh, opened by the matching key. And importantly, we think that the shape of these locks, if you will, can be altered by various uh, environmental factors, by previous uh, UTI and other history, uh, and also by sex differences, uh, and that's once again what I'm going to get into in the second part of the talk. Um, and so here's sort of a model of what that looks like. Henry Schreiber in his lab has been working on this. So if we think about the host as being comprised of a genotype or a set of gene content and alleles and these environmental influences that we're talking about, the intersection of those may give some phenotypic susceptibility to UTI. Um, and then if you look at the bacteria, they also have a set of gene content, and they're doing certain things at a given time with those genes. And uh, if you overlay these and integrate them, you get um, a sort of a map of which interactions might cause uh, UTIs and which interactions are not very likely to cause UTIs. If we focused on the host determinants piece, one of the important host determinants of UTI is a history of UTI. So many clinical studies have shown that history of UTI is a major risk factor for another UTI. Um, this is borne out in a number of epidemiologic studies. And Scott's lab is now trying to model this with um, recurrent urinary tract infections performed in mice. One of the things that they've found um, here is a scanning electron micrograph of the surface of the mouse bladder, which is coated with these large hexagonal superficial epithelial cells. These are the ones that are coated with uh, proteins that uh, are decorated with mannose that serve as the receptors. And after uh, a UTI and recovery of the epithelium, you don't return to the same state. Instead, you have this different appearance, which they're calling sensitized, which not only looks different um, but behaves differently uh, in that when the mouse is re-exposed to bacteria, it is more likely to get UTI at a smaller inoculum dose or when inoculated with bacteria that would not cause UTI in a naive mouse. So there's something about the recovery phase um, that really doesn't get you back uh, to baseline in terms of that. And they're trying to understand the molecular underpinnings of that. I want to talk about role of pili in the GI tract. We talked about how uh, type 1 pili uh, are important for the causing of UT UTIs. They're also important in the GI tract, which once again can be a reservoir for your pathogenic bacteria. Um, Scott's lab has been working on how FIMH, once again, this is the type 1 pilus adhesin, uh, shown here in purified form in the red, uh, really binds to um, oligosaccharides that include mannose uh, in the upper crypts of the intestine. Um, they're also working on a related pili called F17-like pili that actually are related to the uh, pili found in uh, intestinal pathogens like salmonella. Uh, and these uh, bind to different oligosaccharides that are in the lower crypts of the intestine. So it's very likely that the organism uses multiple kinds of pili to occupy different niches uh, within the gut. So what can we do about these things? Um, he's got a class of molecules that they call pilicides, which kill the molecular machine. These pili are assembled by a very complicated multi-protein system, um, and they have some small molecules that inhibit the functioning of this system um, that they call pilicides. And you can see an example of a bacterium here that's making lots and lots of pili. And if you treat it uh, with uh, one of the pilicides shown here, you see that it totally shuts off uh, pilus production. Once again, this is an antivirulence compound. It's not an antibiotic. It keeps this thing from uh, causing infection, but it doesn't kill it, which means that the bug is not pressured uh, to develop resistance. Another type of small molecule that they're working on that I'll finish up with are the manicides. So these are mannose derivatives. On the left here, I'm showing you again a space-filling model of FIMH with mannose bound in the binding pocket. Uh, 
And uh, Scott, along with his collaborators in this company called Fimbrion, are developing manicides. These are mannose derivatives that have these extended moieties that help uh, secure a better bond uh, to that FIMH uh, mannose binding pocket. These are up to a million times more um, tightly bound uh, than mannose. Uh, and as you might expect, they effectively block bacterial binding to the bladder. Here's just an example of some data like this where they've uh, infected mice, allowed them to go two weeks uh, to the chronic cystitis phase and then beginning treatment with various compounds, as you can see here. Uh, over a week, you can see that they lower the bacterial load uh, significantly uh, in the bladder, especially with this C mannose derivative at the top. And they have lots and lots of compounds that they're working on optimizing uh, for various uses right now. So um, the real goal here is to treat and prevent infections without using traditional antibiotics. Um, that is the push uh, in Scott's lab with a focus on women's infectious disease, uh, and in particular UTIs. Um, once again, to cap that off, we have a bunch of bacteria expressing type 1 pili, and if we can interfere with that, we can uh, block bacterial binding to the epithelium of the bladder. And a really interesting set of data that they've just published um, shows that uh, if you colonize the gut of a mouse with your pathogenic E. coli, um, you can give these manicides orally, and it will deplete uh, type 1 pilus bearing uh, uropathogenic E. coli from the gut without depleting the rest of the microbiota there, um, and you can prevent UTIs uh, at the same time. So this is an approach that I think um, will ultimately be able to be developed uh, in women with recurrent UTI for whom uh, re-inoculation from the gastrointestinal tract uh, is a problem. This is a schematic of what they're trying to do, basically to distill out the gut microbiota, leaving those alone, and really directing uh, these small molecule treatments at uropathogenic E. coli. So Scott has a big team. Um, once again, we would like to acknowledge lots of those people uh, in various areas of the research that he does, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and we're very grateful to ORWH, NIDDK, uh, and NIID for the opportunity to do this work. I'll stop there and see if you have any questions on this part. Beautiful work, thank you. I um, wish it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is in part. We're all, we're all a team. Um, my question concerns the, some of the genomics that you showed uh, concerning the E. coli organisms and trying to define uh, genomic features that might enable them to, to work in UTI. I'm imagining that even given the same genome at a strain level, that the expression of that genome has to be very, very different in the bladder, pH, <clears throat> oxygen levels, all, than it is in the gut. It, is, uh, is the team taking a, an approach of looking at the transcriptome or metabolome of those bugs in those two really different environments? It's like salmon going from fresh water to salt water. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. So that's a great question, and yes, the team is working on that. We have some collaborators at the Broad Institute that are really trying to help us look at the transcriptomics of what the bugs are doing when they're inside the gut versus what they're doing inside the bladder. I think I agree they're completely different environments, not only because of what's around, but because of what the bugs have to do to stick, adhere, compete for nutrients, et cetera. Um, you make a good point that the bladder has a wide range of physiological conditions associated with it. pH can be 5 to 8 or more. Osmolarity can be 300 to over 1,000. So there's a lot of different environments that the bug has to navigate there. Um, one of the sort of the drill down things that we're trying to do right now is also identify the transcriptome of bugs that are sitting out in the urinary space, the lumen of the bladder, versus ones that are growing inside epithelial cells. As you might imagine, it's a little tricky to separate those populations, um, but if we can get to a point where we feel like we've done that, um, then I think looking at those transcriptional programs would be very interesting. Emery. Um, are these uh, E. coli strains normally present in the healthy gut microbiome? Yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, does the healthy gut microbiome contain uropathogenic E. coli normally? So people think of the gut as having lots of E. coli in it. It's actually a relatively minor component of the microbiota compared to anaerobes and other things. Um, and this is, a, I think, a little bit where that lock and key idea comes in. 
Um, in other words, there are E. coli strains that may have some virulence determinants that would allow it to, under the right circumstances, cause a UTI. And maybe that bug, uh, if I put it in the guts of 20 women in this room, would cause UTI in one of those, but not in the others. And so I think there's a lot of complicated um, relationships between the virulence factors and other attributes expressed by the bug uh, and the permissive factors, if you will, that would be uh, features of the host. You don't really have to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the next presentation is by Dr. David Hunstad, and uh, the talk is Sex Differences in Pathogenesis of Urinary Tract Infection. Thank you. Okay. So now it's me. <laughs> um, and as I said, uh, we are in my lab working on sex differences in pathogenesis of UTI. The nice part is I won't have to do quite as much background in this section since I've already given you uh, a sketch of what mouse models of urinary tract infection look like. Um, but really, uh, for this audience, um, hopefully what we're doing in sex differences will be uh, of interest. I do also have a disclosure uh, to share with you. Um, I serve on the board of a company in Switzerland that doesn't work on UTIs at all, so it's not directly related. Um, so to introduce this topic, uh, I want to just cover some epidemiology of urinary tract infection, which... When you say UTI to people, they think, well, that's a disease that women get. And of course, um, for a large part of the lifespan, that's true. Um, I want to focus a little bit on children, uh, where the epidemiology is a little bit different. So 3 to 5% of girls and about 1% of boys will have a UTI prior to puberty. Um, whereas later in life, uh, again, it becomes uh, predominantly a female disease, where over half of women will have at least one UTI during their lifetime. Um, and if you look at young men and middle-aged men, uh, there are essentially almost no UTIs in this group um, unless there are sort of uh, mitigating factors like a spinal cord injury, neurogenic bladder, um, a need for intermittent catheterization, et cetera. And people have known about, obviously, this sex discrepancy for a long time, and it's been attributed mostly to anatomic factors. So uh, once again, thinking of the gut as the reservoir for uropathogenic bacteria, the distance that one needs to travel from the anus to the urethra uh, is shorter uh, in a female. The length of the urethra from the external up to the bladder is also shorter in a female. Uh, and people think that the vaginal perineal microenvironment of a woman uh, may be permissive to transit a bacteria, and men obviously uh, lack that environment. So these things are hypothesized, but we don't really have any data to suggest whether these are actually uh, true. Now, um, this was touched on a little bit yesterday in a couple of sessions uh, related to infection and immunity. There are sex differences in a variety of clinical conditions, so cardiovascular disease, a bunch of neuroscience stuff, which we heard about yesterday, which was awesome. Um, and then immunology, um, vaccine responses, uh, as was discussed yesterday. Uh, and also, there's a lot of work in viral infections, influenza, and things like that, uh, that Sabre Klein and others have done. Uh, showing that uh, there are differences uh, based on sex uh, in immune responses to infection. Um, and so we wanted to, with that as background, and, and given this longstanding hypothesis about anatomy, um, we wanted to test the hypothesis that there were additional factors beyond anatomy that would favor uh, UTI in females and make this such a female disease. So a few comments about the mouse as a preclinical model. I didn't really show you much mouse data in Scott's talk. Um, although they work a lot in mice. Um, I'm going to get into the details a little bit more here. Um, mice have been used to study UTIs for a long time. Um, the existing mouse models have been around for about 25 years. Um, there are many advantages to this. The mouse obviously has an immune system that's at least somewhat like a human. Um, there are genetic tools uh, that one can use on the host side. And importantly, the bladder environment is very similar in a mouse and a human. So uh, once again, here is an SEM of the bladder surface where you have these large hexagonal superficial epithelial cells. And if you zoom in on that, these are coated with a uh, crystalline array of proteins called uroplakins. These uroplakins are what are decorated with mannose and serve as the receptor uh, for FIMH on the tips of uh, pili uh, so that E. coli may bind uh, to the bladder. And so E. coli does this. Other bacteria can do this uh, as well. Um, and interestingly, uh, the bladders of female mice can be inoculated by catheter. So this is the way that everyone's always done it. We had a little bit of conversation yesterday about how in some fields uh, 
males are used um, in a lot of preclinical models almost exclusively because they're easier for some reason. Um, and in our field, uh, it's the opposite. So females have been used traditionally because they're easier uh, and you can do these things. I want to remind you uh, of this slide without going through it all again, but there's an acute cycle here that starts with attachment invasion, formation of intracellular bacterial communities, and that after the acute infection is over, the two results are formation of quiescent reservoirs or a chronic cystitis phenotype, and the balance of these two outcomes depends on the inoculum dose and also the strain of mouse uh, that you're using. So um, just a comment about chronic cystitis, which most people who are in the medical field don't think about a ton. Um, this is not something that we see a lot because uh, at least in the developed world, antibiotics are relatively easily obtained, um, actually obtained more easily in some parts of the world than in the United States. Um, and really, we don't sort of let women sit around for two weeks with untreated urinary tract infection. They wouldn't be very happy with us uh, if we did that. Um, and there are some old data that show that if you um, placebo treat uh, women with bacterial cystitis, they will have ongoing uh, inflammation and bacteriuria uh, for weeks. Um, that was fortunately 45 years ago, uh, and so we're not going to plan any more uh, trials like that. So um, the preclinical work, once again, in my field has really all been done in females, and um, literally if you go to UTI-related meetings, people say this is fine because it's a female disease anyway, um, but the reason is that you can't reach the bladder of a male mouse reliably with a catheter. So this is why people have done females almost exclusively. So our goal uh, in this project that I'm going to tell you about was to develop a mirroring model that you can use in both male and female hosts and to use this to define sex differences, once again thinking that there would be features of females beyond anatomy that further favor um, the establishment of UTIs. So here's what the model looks like, uh, mouse under anesthesia with the schematic uh, urinary tract pasted on top of it. Um, and we just make a small abdominal incision. Um, you can do this for about three millimeters or so, deliver the bladder up right through that in, uh, incision, uh, and inoculate it directly with a 30-gauge needle um, with your favorite strain of uropathogenic E. coli. The inoculum dose we use is about 10 to the seventh uh, CFU of bacteria. Then you can uh, sew the mouse up, and you can monitor this mouse for anywhere from a few minutes to months, um, just like you could in a catheter-infected female. Um, and you can do all the downstream types of analysis that um, have been done traditionally uh, in this field for a couple of decades. So let's take a look at some data uh, as to what that looks like. So here I'm showing you acute cystitis in male and female mice of the C3H strain. The C3H strain is important for some data I'm going to show later because it features vesicoureteral reflux, reflux from the bladder up into the kidneys, which gives you a more robust kidney infection. The most common uh, strain of mice used in my field, the black six mouse, um, is a little more resistant uh, to UTI in general and to kidney infection in particular. What I'm showing you here are colony forming units or bacterial loads in the bladder at these time points, six and 24 uh, hours. And as you can see, there's a slight difference in the bacterial loads early. Um, this was associated, actually, with a more robust early cytokine response in females. Um, but uh, this catches up. This, uh, in both males and females, um, goes up a couple of logs in the first 24 hours, and that's that intracellular replication piece that I was telling you about. So that by 24 hours, this infection looks essentially uh, exactly the same. If you count the number of in, uh, intracellular bacterial communities, in the bladder uh, by staining and microscopy, you see that those numbers are the same. And if you look at these intracellular bacterial communities using green fluorescent protein expressing E. coli, and you use confocal microscopy to look at the structure of those, they look essentially the same. So other than this early um, slight difference, uh, the pathogenesis of, of acute bacterial infection in the bladders is the same in females and males. and Notably, our surgically infected females look exactly like traditional catheter-infected females. So that means that the stuff we're going to do next um, can be compared to the stuff that's out there uh, over the last couple of decades. So I want to focus in uh, then on the bladder some more and look at a later time point 
when, once again, there are two outcomes after the acute infection in the bladder is over. One is to form quiescent intracellular reservoirs. These are small nests of bacteria totaling about 10 to the 3 per bladder uh, that don't get er eradicated by antibiotics. And these uh, mice have chronic cystitis. This is the long-term, high titer, very inflammatory uh, cystitis that we see in the absence of treatment in about 20% of C3H females uh, at this inoculum dose. So what happens in males uh, is this. So this is one of those moments where you're like, huh. Uh, we essentially saw that all the males that we um, infected in this way had high uh, bladder bacterial loads at two weeks. None of them went to this reservoir state. And if you looked by various uh, ways that I'm not going to share with you, this was a phenocopy of these 20% of females that also developed uh, chronic cystitis. So it looked the same histologically, had a lot of the same um, inflammatory milieu. Uh, and so this was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, when you look at the kidneys, we we're maybe even more surprised. So here I'm showing you once again at 6, 24 hours and two weeks, the bacterial loads now in the kidneys females and males in the C3H mouse, and uh, whereas females mostly resolve infection over two weeks, with a couple having uh, more high titer pyelonephritis, the males do this, which is a huge surprise and not something that we were uh, expecting at all. When you open up these mice to harvest these kidneys, um, you see this. Um, so here's the left kidney of a mouse, spleen, stomach, and here's a big abscess uh, on the front of the kidney. Um, which we ended up seeing in about 90% of males uh, infected in this way. Um, and this is something that's not common in females at all. If you do this in C3H females uh, infected either by traditional catheter or by needle, like we're doing now, um, you see this in 1 in 30 to 1 in 50 females. So that's an important side point just because this will open the door to studying the pathogenesis of renal abscess formation in a way that people haven't done before. You can't write a grant that says, I'm going to infect 50 mice and I'm going to take the one that has an abscess and try to figure out something about it. So now we can uh, do that, which I'm not going to talk about today. So once again, we were definitely surprised by these initial data uh, that males, once you bypass these anatomic protections that males typically have, they actually um, got worse UTI in this model. So what's going on here? Um, I can tell you without, I'm not showing you the data, that it's not a difference in the degree of vesicoureteral reflux in males versus females. We've done a lot of comparative experiments to show that that's not uh, a difference. So are we talking about genes, chromosomes, hormones? These are the kinds of sex differences that um, came up in a variety of ways yesterday as well. I do want to point out that we're in the C3H mouse here, so it's not quite as easy to grab a bunch of genetic tools off the shelf. Um, the four core genotypes mice, which were mentioned yesterday, uh, androgen receptor deficient mice, those exist in a black six, um, but not necessarily in a C3H. So we couldn't go right after the chromosomal thing, um, but we could do some uh, surgeries, and so we did that. Um, here I'm showing you data from where we would go and adectomize female or male mice uh, a couple of weeks before UTI was given. And here I'm showing you just a single time point, two weeks post-infection, both bladders and kidneys. On this top uh, panel in females that were either sham operated or, or overreactomized two weeks before UTI, and you can see at a glance that there's no real difference uh, that's imposed by overreactomy uh, on the outcomes of UTI in these females. In males, we saw something quite different. So same type of a graph, sham and castrated males, where uh, in the sham males, once again, most of them have high titer cystitis and pyelonephritis at two weeks post-infection. Uh, but castration prior to uh, UTI is protective against these uh, severe UTI outcomes. Does that make any sense? So people, now you're really talking about whether androgens are involved in UTI risk. Um, and so we combed uh, the clinical and epidemiologic literature to see uh, if this made any sense in terms of human um, UTI. Um, there is a little bit of data that women with polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a common hyperandrogenic state, do have higher rates of UTI. And in one of those studies, there was a little bit of data suggesting that um, if antiandrogen therapy was given, that UTI risk would go down. These studies are not designed to look at this at all. So this is like combing through little bits of data uh, in larger studies looking at other things. And it's also true that there's some epidemiologic data demonstrating that when men do get UTIs, 
um, such as men in the hospital or men with spinal cord injuries, that the morbidity, the severity of pyelonephritis is worse uh, in men. So it does make maybe a little bit of sense, although uh, you wouldn't expect that there'd be a lot of epidemiologic data out there about androgens uh, in UTI. And it's important to note that the testes, which we've just removed in these castration experiments, um, make other things besides androgens, um, activin, and, and other things. So can we complement this back? Um, we talked a little bit about this um, HPG axis yesterday. So um, the gonads in this case make testosterone, which as we heard, can activate the androgen receptor, which is ubiquitously expressed um, uh, in and on uh, all cell types, or it can be acted upon by aromatase, uh, converted to estradiol, and, and uh, activate the estrogen receptor. And so we aimed to see if we could complement these castrations with DHT, which is a strong androgen receptor agonist and also not subject to aromatization. And you can see here that we can do that. Um, same types of graphs I was showing you before, two weeks post-infection where uh, castration is protective and DHT actually uh, promotes severe UTI outcomes. And if you just give DHT versus placebo pellets to females, you can see that you induce susceptibility to severe UTI uh, in those females. One more piece of data is that um, in a black six background now where the dynamic range of this assay is not so high, um, here we have males, normal males, uh, androgen receptor deficient males, and wild type females. And you can see uh, at 24 hours post-infection that the kidney titers are much lower uh, in the androgen receptor deficient males, comparable to females. And you can also, in these uh, black six females, you can androgenize to induce susceptibility with DHT here. Uh, and you can give enzalutamide, it's a second generation anti-androgen, uh, and block that effect. So all these data together demonstrate that activation of the androgen receptor uh, predisposes to severe UTI outcomes. Does this make sense in children? Uh, it might, because the incidence of UTI in baby boys is actually higher than girls for the first six months of life, and the shape of that curve mirrors uh, a postnatal testosterone surge that's seen in uh, infant boys uh, following birth. So we, with the help of the SCORE, uh, have really um, started to collect a bunch of babies. Here's a, here's a population where the, the rate of UTI is about two to one female to male before two years of age. And we can collect uh, samples from these, which we've been doing to try to get uh, some human correlates uh, of sex differences in UTI there. So the current state is that we have this new model that we can study sex differences uh, in, in UTI and that androgen receptor activation potentiates UTI susceptibility and severity. This does actually um, support the longstanding idea that anatomic aspects of the urinary tract are protective for males, uh, and that once these are bypassed, that um, males may be more susceptible. So we're doing a lot, uh, as you might imagine now, to try to figure out the mechanisms of this, uh, both in terms of immune responses, um, epithelial interactions uh, with UPEC, um, renal scarring, which I won't talk about, but which has a separable androgen effect on it, we're making a lot of genetic tools in C3H, but we're also working on androgenizing more black six females uh, because that would uh, open up a lot of opportunity for us to look on the host side. Um, with that, I will stop. I just want to once again thank um, ORWH and NIDK uh, for the opportunity to do this, and I'll take maybe one or two questions. Thanks. That was really fascinating. So is the androgen acting in the bladder or the kidney? Yeah, so I would say that that's a little bit of a tricky question. I, I believe that the answer is both, but um, since those two organs are connected and in the C3H mouse there's also there's anti-grade flow of urine, but there's also the opportunity for retrograde flow, um, we've talked about ways to try to separate those effects. Um, if you tie off the ureter, you're going to have a ureteral obstruction injury to the kidney. We've talked about, you know, doing diverting nephrostomy tubes in a mouse, and that might be a little tricky, uh, especially because you probably can't let them walk around for two weeks and look at chronic outcomes. But we may be able to try to separate um, the two compartments. I actually think there are probably effects in both based on some data I'm not showing you, but um, I do think we need to think about um, how within the model we can try to physically separate them. <laughs>
Um, so antigen receptor is expressed pretty widely. Um, we are in our C3H mice. There's not data specifically in that model, so we're working on doing that right now. Um, but the renal tubular epithelium, bladder epithelium, immune cells that are both present and recruited to both organs uh, all would be expected to express antigen receptor. So there's lots of possibilities as to how this is, how this is working. Okay. Emery. Um, I, I'm not talking about this with as so far any plans or consideration with all these packs with um, symptoms of what is called interstitial cystitis or um, I have a more general name. Yeah, um, chronic bladder pain. And have, have you guys ever looked at that? If, 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 in those patients, uh, an increased number of these packs? Yeah, so um, the question is whether chronic UTI or the Persistence of bacteria in the epithelium of the bladder is related to the the symptom complex we call interstitial cystitis or chronic bladder pain, and the answer is I don't think we know. Um, one of the things that would be great is if we had a panel of biopsies from bladders of women with interstitial cystitis, um, and or in between episodes of recurrent UTI, which I think the latter would be a little tricky to get. Um, and it would be, in terms of finding bacteria, maybe a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack there. So even if you did biopsy those women and look for evidence of bacterial infection by whatever method, microscopy or sequencing or whatever, you may not find it, and there may just be a sampling issue there. So, um, so I would say we don't know the answer to how exactly this might be related to IC. Yeah. Hi. Uh, have you thought at all about whether it's engaging a membrane-associated androgen receptor or the classical? Yeah, we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, but uh, certainly interested in doing that as we try to drill down on mechanism. Thanks. Thank you. So the next presentation is by Dr. Lauren Weiss from University of California, San Francisco, and the title of the talk is X, Drugs, Rock, and Rolls. So yes, I'm gonna to talk to you today about X drugs, rock and rolls. Um, so this is a project, or a series of projects that's really been worked on by a whole bunch of past um, lab members, as well as one current um, lab member, a postdoc, Michaela Tralia, who's taking the work forward. Um, so as we heard yesterday, many if not all of the common complex heritable diseases um, that human geneticists are very interested in um, have some kind of sex bias. And yet most of our studies are really not designed to think about sex differences. Um, and in fact, I would argue that a lot of study design is, around, is, is designed around this assumption that because most of the genome is equivalent at the sequence level between males and females, that that means that most genetic risk is the same between males and females, and we don't really account for the possibility of different effects. Um, but as human biologists, we know that, that there are limited sources or potential sources for sexual dimorphism. Um, we can think about the sex chromosome complement. Um, we can think about hormonal exposures um, or features of the cultural environment that might differ by sex. And so we tried to come up with some testable hypotheses um, that we could look at in the kinds of genetic data sets that we could easily generate or obtain. Um, so first, we can look at the contribution of the X chromosome um, and whether the, the uh, genes on the X might have a disproportionate role. Um, we don't typically have measurements on hormones, but we know that many genes um, have expression that is impacted by um, androgens or estrogens, and so we can look at steroid responsive genes, and if those have a large role, we can actually infer um, that steroid hormones themselves may have a role. Um, one theory that's been common in autism, uh, my field, would be that females are um, socialized a little bit differently, and so you might be just missing those at the milder end of the spectrum. And that could correspond with those that have a little bit less burden of genetic risk. And therefore, what you might expect is that for those females who are diagnosed with autism, they would have a greater burden of genetic risk than the corresponding males. That's something that we can easily test. 
And then finally, we wanted to think about, you know, these anthropometric sex differences um, that are very clear to everyone. We waist hip ratio, height, weight, PMI, um, and um, think about whether the diseases we're interested in have very disease specific mechanisms or whether some of the same biology might be involved between these anthropometric traits and the common diseases that, that we could be interested in. Um, so most of the data that I'm gonna talk to you um, about today is in autism, but I'll sprinkle in um, uh, some other complex diseases that we've surveyed to kind of complement the autism work. And overall, we look at two you know, flavors of hypotheses, as I like to think about them. Um, so the first is that you know, female genes may not be equal to male genes. So the material could be the same, but the effect can be a little different. And so the way that we test this is um, by sex permutation. So if we have a sample that's, for example, has 8,000 male cases and 2,000 female cases, you could see a difference that's arising because of sex, or you could see a difference that's arising simply because you've divided your sample into a group of 8,000 and a group of 2,000. And so we can create many, many random samples of 8,000 and 2,000 to distinguish what are the true sex effects. Um, and then the second kind of hypothesis would be if we're thinking about, for example, androgen responsive genes, um, we wanna know do those genes uh, have a larger role in genetic risk than we would expect by chance. And so in that case, we can create matched sets of genes that are similar in all other features but have nothing to do, for example, with androgens. And, and then we can do gene or SNP-based permutations um, and test those kinds of hypotheses in that way. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do is the more typical um, design GWAS study. So this is an autism where we would be looking at males and females together. And in this case, as I mentioned, in kind of the largest data set um, we could gather, we come up with about 8,000 male cases and about 2,000 female cases. And in each case, we used um, controls, either family-based or unrelated controls um, for the males and for the females. And so the results that we see, uh, I'm just showing you kind of the top five here. And you can see the first result does meet our criteria for statistical significance. Um, it's on uh, chromosome eight near this gene called EXT1. Um, the other very striking thing is that, you know, in these very top five results, you see um, two that are located on the X chromosome. Um, so that's quite intriguing um, to, to think about as well. And then I'll draw your attention to the, the fourth result there on chromosome seven near this gene XOC4. So the next thing that we want to do is the most simple to, to look um, at a GWAS separately in our male cases and controls as well as then in our female cases and controls. Um, so the male results, um, you see the same top result near EXT1, um, and we find that basically all of the signal in the combined sample was coming from those males. Um, we also see in this case, you know, three um, X chromosome loci in our top five um, and so, uh, you know, again, that's really striking in terms of thinking about a role for the X chromosome, and those also are coming up in the males. And then we see this locus on chromosome six um, that didn't come up as strongly um, in the combined group. Uh, when we look at the females, although the sample size is much, much smaller, and we do still see that our top result is genome-wide significant. And it's at a completely different locus that we would never have seen looking at males and females together um, near this alpha catenin subunit gene. Um, similarly, that, that result on chromosome 7 near XOC4, um, that it was it's shown up in the combined analysis essentially was coming all from those 2,000 females. All of the top results in females indeed showed significant sex differences. And so these are really female-specific autism loci. Um, so the next thing that we did was want to look um, a little more carefully at the X chromosome. Um, given those interesting top results, we wanted to ask, um, you know, across all of the top X chromosome results, uh, do we see sex differences or sex heterogeneity more often than we expect by chance? And so in comparison, we can look at the top autosomal uh, results. 
And using our permutation, we can generate what we should expect by chance. Um, in terms of uh, SNPs that have an effect in the same direction, uh, which is in blue, versus the opposite direction, which is in purple here. And you can see that in the autosomes, what we um, observe um, in males here is very, very similar to what we expect by chance. Um, but when we look at the X chromosome, we can see that, in fact, we observe many more sex differences, a much bigger purple proportion here, than what we would expect simply by chance. And, and this was also true, we surveyed nine other complex um, heritable disorders, and in three of those nine, we also saw this pattern of the X chromosome specifically has increased sex heterogeneity. And sometimes that's driven by um, male-limited results and sometimes by female-limited results. So the next thing that we looked at is this hypothesis. It's actually been very pervasive in human genetics. It's called the liability threshold model um, because the theory goes that if you have this normal distribution of genetic risk or liability in the population and you have a big prevalence difference, um, what could be driving it is this threshold difference. Um, so if you only need you know, this amount of risk uh, if you're a male to, to get a diagnosis of autism, but um, there's a higher threshold for females, so you would need more genetic risk if you're a female, that would result in some of the phenomena that we do see, um, like uh, lower prevalence in females uh, with autism, and also potentially increased severity. Um, so we looked at this in a couple different ways. Um, so the first thing that we looked at are um, rare copy number variants that individually are relatively highly penetrant um, compared to common polymorphisms. And indeed, we find just like you would expect under this theory, that female probands have more of these um, copy number variants that are likely to be pathogenic than males. And this was associated with the sex ratio, but not with severity in this case. However, much to our surprise, as well as everyone else's, we also saw that female controls um, have more pathogenic looking CNVs than male controls. And this was true in you know, many well utilized um, control data sets like HapMap and Thousand Genomes, and now has been independently replicated in uh, several other very large population studies. Um, and you can look at different features of these copy number variants, and we see significant differences um, by number of copy number variants, by gene content. Um, and it does not appear to be a reproductive um, bias. Um, so it appears to be a population bias. Um, and the, the autism sex difference did survive correction for the control difference, but it made us think maybe we're not looking at exactly what we thought we were looking at. Um, so the next thing that we looked at was the potential of gene-sex interaction in rare single nucleotide variants that are known to cause Mendelian disease, but that um, is associated with autism. So there's a class of diseases called rasopathies. They're autosomal dominant single um, gene disorders, um, where the rasopathies themselves have a one-to-one -one even sex ratio um, and are associated with autism. However, if you use an autism screening tool um, called the SCQ, you find that there's a male bias, about three to one, for those individuals with rasopathies that also meet these criteria for autism traits. However, across the four disorders that are all in the same class um, that we looked at, um, there were major differences. So in neurofibromatosis type one, we see over a quarter of the males would meet this criteria, but none of the females. However, in Noonan syndrome, we see about a quarter of the males and about a quarter of the females meet these criteria. So there appears to be no sex bias in the one case and a relatively extreme sex bias in the other. Um, so this, we think, is, is a great example of a specific gene by sex interaction effect. Um, so finally, we wanted to look at our general um, common polymorphism data um, to look at this potential genetic burden hypothesis. So the way that we did this was generating what are called polygenic risk scores. Um, so adding up all of the, the risk basically across the genome um, to look at a, a whole distribution of this common genetic risk. 
And the way that we do this is to use a male autism data set to generate these predictions and then apply them to an independent male autism data set as well as our female autism data set. And so you can see in the red versus the gray and the dark blue versus the light blue um, that although it looks subtle here, this is actually a highly significant difference in distributions between the cases and the controls. However, between the male cases and the female cases, or the male controls and the female controls, we don't see any difference at all. And so it looks like the common genetic risk is very equivalent as far as we can measure it in males and in females. And so we really don't support this genetic risk burden hypothesis um, using our common polymorphism data. Um, this was similar across the nine disorders that we survey, they all have different sex biases. You know, some uh, have higher prevalence in males, higher prevalence in females are about equal. And none of them followed this pattern of increased genetic burden or increased heritability in the lower prevalence sex. Um, so the one major heritability difference we saw was in hypertension, where females had higher heritability than males. Um, but hypertension is thought to have a pretty similar prevalence. Um, also specific to the HLA region, we saw a greater impact um, for the region in ankylosing spondylitis in males, but that is a male bias disorder. Um, and in Crohn's disease in females, and Crohn's disease is roughly equivalent um, in the sexes. The other really intriguing observation was in multiple sclerosis, where we had our largest, most powerful um, data set to look at, we could actually estimate a highly significant gene-sex interaction component um, in the heritability. This was pretty substantial, about 6%. Um, and so that, you know, certainly requires some follow-up, um, but was, you know, quite an interesting um, observation. Um, so next we wanted to look at the contribution or potential enrichment for androgen-responsive or estrogen-responsive genes. In autism, we really didn't see any signal um, from these gene sets, but in the other um, disorders that we surveyed, we saw in three of the nine, in rheumatoid arthritis, in coronary artery disease, and in type 1 diabetes, and we saw um, either evidence for um, enrichment in this gene category or sex differences in this gene category um, in at least one of the sexes. And across um, nearly all of the nine anthropometric traits um, that we looked at, we also um, saw this. And so, you know, I think that's telling us that the, our approach is working because um, we would have expected that at least in the anthropometric traits. So finally, we wanted to look at this hypothesis that, you know, the same or very similar biological mechanisms might be at work creating those anthropometric sex differences and um, common disease sex differences. So the way that we did this was to look at a SNP where, for example, the minor allele might have no impact on height in females, but increase height in males. Um, so a SNP showing a sex difference in effects. And then we took the genetic region, the regions around those SNPs to be genetic regions of sexual dimorphism for anthropometric traits. We looked at those same regions to ask whether um, they're associated with case control status um, in disease. And if the, the answer was yes, then we couldn't conclude that sexually dimorphic biology is contributing to these disorders. Um, so in autism, the answer was yes. And we did see a significant um, contribution from these anthropometric sex-specific SNPs. And across the nine other disorders that we looked at, in five, um, we also saw significant contribution in at least one of the sexes. Um, across all of the anthropometric traits, we saw a highly significant contribution um, from these sets. Um, and so, again, we think that this, this approach is working pretty well. Um, so overall, we see that the X chromosome often shows increased sex heterogeneity compared to the autosomes, and that can include both male-limited and female-limited risk. Um, not for autism, but for some other traits, um, we do see um, hormone-responsive gene enrichment. 
across the board, we really did not find support for this liability threshold model um, <laughs> using common um, polymorphism data. Um, and we did see very often this major pleiotropy between common disease and anthropometric traits um, in sex-specific contribution. So across the board, we feel like these genetic methods can address some biological hypotheses about sexual dimorphism in disease. Um, so I also want to say if there are any students here, you have any students who are looking for postdocs, I'm hiring um, for both some experimental induced pluripotent stem cell model type um, and some genetic analytical projects. So please contact me if anybody's interested. Um, and I want to acknowledge um, the collaborations that contributed to the data that we um, analyzed here, um, as well as the members of my lab and, and funding that's both specific to these projects and, and more general. Thank you. So we can have a couple of questions. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I really like the way there were so many different approaches to the to testing m multiple hypotheses that could explain the, the prevalence uh, difference. So uh, I was curious to hear how you're thinking about the um, sex differences in um, risk SNPs potentially relating to the sex difference in prevalence. So you'd have to hypothesize either that there's some regulatory difference that's specific to those genes or different uh, mutation rates, or uh, how do you make that sort of link? Um, uh, sorry, just to, do you mean in the anthropometric sex specific in, SNPs? In that or first the... bit where you do a sex by diagnosis interaction. Yeah, for the... yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, so, so that's something that we'd like to follow up, um, potentially experimentally. Um, so we do have some human induced pluripotent stem cell models in the lab, including for these specific rasapathies. And so, um, you know, we can use some nice experimental methods, both drugs designed for the pathway that's impacted, and where we're seeing some interesting differences across these disorders, um, but also thinking about the sex difference component um, in terms of, you know, looking at androgens, estrogens, so that would be kind of the first, first pass easiest thing to do and go from there. Great, thanks. Um, uh, my question is about some of the earlier data you showed us with the uh, X-linked SNPs in the GWAS analysis for autism. I noticed that the minor allele frequencies were really low, so good for you for finding them. Uh, so my questions are, uh, is there any information about population stratification of those relatively rare alleles, and are you or others trying to do some resequencing around those regions? I know that some of the, these larger platforms for evaluating uh, X-linked SNPs are less than optimal. Um, so I'm just wondering what the plan is going forward to try to really mine into what those variants might hold. Yeah, um, so good question. So uh, yeah, we're, we're always extremely concerned about, about stratification. Um, so, uh, so we have a couple approaches here. The majority of our data is actually family-based, um, so then we don't really have a stratification issue. Um, and, and we're very careful for the case control component about matching and using, um, you know, a number of principal components um, to correct for any potential stratification. Um, we did look carefully at the X-link SNPs to see if there's anything funny going on, um, and, you know, the data looked pretty good. So, so we, we don't think it's a technical artifact. In terms of thinking about following them up, um, yeah, that would be very interesting. There, um, has been some work looking at rare variants on the X chromosomes. Um, so, uh, you know, that has been uh, covered and will con be better covered with kind of emerging sequencing data. Um, so we don't feel that, like, we need to do that sequencing ourselves. Um, but in terms of if it's these common polymorphisms impacting risk, there would be a lot of potential follow-up to figure out, you know, are these related to genes? Which genes might they be related to? Well, you know, all the typical stuff. So I'm a little out of my depth here, so if this is a off-kilter question, just tell me it's a dumb question. But I'm thinking about the anthropomorphic part at the mm -hmm. end, and um, th what, I'm, I'm not sure what traits you're referring to, but I guess my question is, both my work in the animal models and then like Donna Worlings and, and Dan Gashwins have shown that the developing male brain has more inflammatory markers, right? 
more microglia, more activated astrocytes, cytokines, prostaglandins, et cetera. So are any of your SNPs in your anthropomorphic measures related to inflammation? Because I've also postulated a model very similar to your, your threshold, only mine, the threshold is level of basal inflammation that then when there's an insult trips you over into dysregulation. So. Yeah, so um, so that's exactly what one of the things that we're planning to do is to try, try to understand more about this, you know, we've kind of generated this list of uh, anthropometric sex-specific or um, SNPs empirically, you know, just based on these large data sets that measure these traits, um, but we don't really have a good sense of what they do. So the first quick things that we've done where we looked at whether there is enrichment for androgen responsive or estrogen responsive genes. There is significant enrichment, but it's a really tiny amount. So I don't think that's driving that entire list. Um, and similarly, we've looked at some transcription factors, you know, that are um, likely to, to be also kind of hormone related. Um, and again, we see some signal, but, um, but it doesn't account for a large proportion of the list. Um, the other things that don't account for the list are genes that are differentially expressed in the brain, in the developing brain, um, and um, genes that are correlated with sex in their expression patterns in the brain. Um, so the next step is to do kind of a more unbiased kind of enrichment testing to try to ask in an open-ended way, well, what do these regions have in common? Um, and so, yeah, it could be that if it's there, we would come up with something um, related to inflammatory. Thank you. Okay, so the last talk in this session is about by Dr. Barbara Stancher from University of Chicago. And the talk is Sex-Specific Genetic Architecture of the Human Transcriptome. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I've got a cold. Um, a lot of conferencing lately. So um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, several projects going on in my lab have benefited greatly from the supplementary funding um, through collaborations as well as on my own grants. And um, so it's, it's really been great. Um, we've got a poster out there that also benefited from this work. Um, just one thing before I get started, if, if people are tweeting, I would ask that you just not tweet the summary slide. So I'm going to be talking about some consortium work and we have a larger data set than the results I'm presenting here. So I'd just like to um, not, not hold those results to, uh, to definitely public spreading yet, just yet, okay? Um, all right, so my lab does a lot of work looking at gene expression. And um, why do we study gene expression? Well, we know that normal cell health and function and development depends on having the right genes turned on at the right time and in the right place. And we know where these patterns are perturbed. Sometimes there are quite deleterious effects. Nonetheless, in every species, there's a lot of variation among individuals with respect to gene expression levels. Much of this has a genetic component, and studies in humans and other species have mapped locations in the genome where these genetic effects are that, that regulate gene expression levels. And importantly um, for this crowd, certainly um, disease mapping studies have identified lots of regions of the genome contributing to disease and wondered, okay, so what are these SNPs doing? And one of the things that we find out they're doing are regulating genes. And so there's sort of a practical component as well as um, genome understanding, just functional genomics, how does our genome work, um, that, that guides our research. So obviously we've been sitting here for a day and a quarter now, I guess, talking about um, sex differences. And really the thing I'd like to emphasize here is this bottom point. We all know why, why all of these points are important. But, but this one, really, one of the longstanding paradigms is that the differences in, um, in many of the phenotypes that we look at has been attributed to either hormone levels between the sex or sex chromosome genes. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll realize that there's really the interplay of those things, perhaps with um, autosomal genes as well. All right. So we take an approach called expression quantitative trait locus mapping. So how many people have heard that word? Okay, not that many. <laughs> so, so I'm going to walk you through this, and it's, it's not really that complicated. So let's, um, let's imagine we've measured a gene's expression level among everybody in this room, 
and we have um, all of our genetic variation. And so we use statistical methods to kind of walk through the genome and ask the question, is there a genetic variant where the differences between us correlate with our expression differences between us? So as you look at this panel on the right, imagine we've measured one gene's expression level, and we've got one place in the genome where there's a CT polymorphism, and each one of these dots is a person, let's say in this room. So we sort people by whether they're CC, CT, or TT, and we're just looking for this kind of an association. T allele is associated with higher expression, C allele with lower expression. And so what we do is we walk through the genome, SNP by SNP by SNP, and do this linear regression. So the math isn't that difficult, the multiple testing is, um, and so we have to be very careful about all the things you would with regular genetic association studies, stratification, and many of these things. And so we do this not just for one gene, we do this genome-wide. So we have a population of individuals, we genotype them, survey them for gene expression of the whole genome, and then use these tools, EQTL mapping, to identify places in the genome where there are polymorphisms that associate with gene expression differences. And so I'm really interested in this question of, are there sex-biased EQTLs? And, and there's some evidence for this in animals and in humans. Um, and so what we're looking for in this case, or why we're doing this, is because we're thinking that these regions might explain some of these genetic associations that have a sex difference, exactly like what Lori was just talking about right now. Um, you could imagine that a polymorphism can have a different effect in males and females, the exact same SNP. And so what we're looking for are these kinds of patterns that you see in the bottom here, where you could have a sex-specific effect. So let's say we've got an EQTL association in one sect and, and really no signal in the other. Or you can even have sex-opposite effects, where the low-expressing allele in one sex is the high-expressing allele in another sex. And you can even have these where just the association's there in both sexes, but to a different extent. Okay, so different, different effect size. And so that's what we're going to be looking for. So I'll introduce you to the NIH Genotype Tissue Expression Project. So this is a large-scale project um, that surveyed um, 50 tissues from over 900 deceased donor patients, and, as well as 10 brain regions. Um, there's RNA-seq genotyping and whole genome sequencing for all individuals. The data is still being generated. It's being released as it's generated. Um, and uh, just a week, week and a half ago, there was a special issue in Nature with many of the publications from, from um, one of the analysis releases. Um, there's a very nice genome browser um, data portal where you can go and look up your favorite gene and find out if there are SNPs that regulate it. Um, and there's a new phase of GTEx coming, this enhancing GTEx phase, which is adding additional genomics data to these samples that have already been collected. And there are biobanked samples that are stored and that you can request access for for your own research as well. Um, so it's a huge data resource, um, and for statistical geneticists, it's also a gold mine and very fun to work with. So, um, but it was designed originally to, to ask this question about tissue specificity of EQTLs, because there's lots of GWAS done, and people say, okay, so what are my SNPs doing? And the very early days had studies where there was somebody did whole blood, somebody did skin cells, and yeah, there were things different, but they were different people, there were different analytic methods, and so on. And so this really homogenized the whole thing together to really ask this question um, and bring it into the context of disease. So we wanted to look at these sex-biased EQTLs in GTEx. And just to give you a flavor of this, um, just kind of look at the green here. It doesn't matter about the other parts for the moment. But you can see the tissues that were available with the data freeze that we were working with and their sample sizes. So anywhere from the biggest one being just over 350 individuals, but you can see there were some um, sex-specific tissues and others that there were very few samples collected for. Um, and and we selected a set of tissues that we would have a potential power to do the kinds of analyses we're interested in. So this is an incredibly busy slide. I'll just draw you your attention to the fact that we subsetted 20 of those tissues that had at least 150 individuals, so you can see those counts here, and then male-females. So the point I'd like to make here is that the average male-female ratio in GTEx is, is really unbalanced. So there are many more males than females. And um, that complicates things for us uh, statistically because we don't have equal power in both sexes. 
But it doesn't stop us. It just complicates things. We're up for a challenge. So um, we're exploring multiple different ways of looking at this question that I just, that I just mentioned about the sex-biased EQTLs. But for the purpose of today's talk, I'm really only focusing on one, which is testing the SNP by sex interaction. And if you think of those plots I showed you of the types of things we're looking for with the three panels on the bottom, basically we're testing for a difference in slope between males and females. Is the slope different? And that could be because they're crossed. It could be because one's flat. It could be, you know, difference in magnitude. All right. So I'm just going to show you some vignettes, okay? And as I said, we actually, GTEx now has a bigger data set, so I'm, I'm showing you results that were part of our ongoing work on this. And um, so, so this will change a little bit, um, and we have better power now, I can tell you already. So um, here's just a, an overall view of one of the tissues. This is thyroid, and what we're looking at are SNPs along the chromosomes and how strongly they... Um, had an association, an interaction association. So this is an actual p-value. So um, log 10 of the p-value along here. So higher means more significant. And so you can see that, you know, if you look at regular EQTL signals, these could be up in like 500 range. So interactions are smaller uh, p-values, um, statistically more challenging. And so we don't expect the p-values to be that high. But you can see there's a little bit of signal, kind of. And this is, this is uh, deviating from the null expectation. So there are associations here. Here's whole blood. Um, you can see maybe a few more than you see in thyroid. And um, so, so this is pretty typical. These aren't you know, unusual. I'm not going to show you all 20 tissues. But this is pretty much what they look like. So if we um, ask how many genes are we talking about that have a significant cis SNP by sex interaction. I'm sorry, I didn't define cis, but what we do with these analyses is we go to the gene itself in the genome and we put a window around it and we test SNPs only in those windows. So that's, that's what I mean by cis here. It's kind of a focused um, region because that's where all, many of the regulatory elements for a given gene are very close to it. So it's kind of a candidate region approach as opposed to genome-wide. And so what you can see is that in any one tissue, we're looking at autosomally, 200, 200 and something genes. We think a lot of these are false positives, to be honest. And um, we can tell this with some of the bigger sets that we're starting to look at. Um, but, but, we, but there's real signal in here. And I'm going to show you some that you know, I, I think you'll find quite convincing. And then we you know, also analyze the X differently. We have to deal with that differently because of dosage effects and so on. Um, and so we find associations on both. The X chromosome is not enriched for these effects, um, which is um, possibly different than what another group has shown um, in another data set that was whole blood. Um, about 2.5% of these are hormone or hormone response genes, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the, um, a little bit more of this. And so here, if we say where did these associations fall relative to the gene? Here's regular cis EQTLs, right? And each one of these dots represents the most significant SNP for a gene and centered around the transcription start site. And so if you had 20,000 genes you tested, 20,000 dots here, this is adipose, you see that really the vast majority of the strong signals, which is what's plotted here, right, and the density is really right at the transcription start site, right? You can see that. This is a very well-known pattern for looking at where are regulatory variants in the human genome. Now, if you look at the interactions, obviously this is a pretty different story. They're kind of spread out um, around the region. Now, this could be biological. Enhancers are spread out around the region, and so biologically that could make sense. Um, it could also be that we're still in the phase of looking at some false positives here, too. So, um, but it's a strikingly different pattern, for sure. All right. So let's get into a couple examples. So on the left panel, um, I'll walk you through what you're looking at. So um, this is an association in adipose for this gene and this SNP. You can see the association in males. So you see this strong association in males. You see it in the exact opposite direction in females. And this is what it would have looked like if you combined everybody together, right? So, so we would never pick that up. And so if this was a SNP that um, was associated with your disease, you would say, oh, well, it wasn't an EQTL and adipose, move on, right? But with this level of data, and let's say it was, you know, I mean, who knows what your trait is you're looking at, it might be relevant to you 
in females or in males, right? Same story over here. Different gene um, and different SNP, but the same story. Completely missed. So um, this is another one. This one's kind of interesting because this is a hormone, um, and uh, it's the same story. I don't have the p-value on here for the combined sample, but you, know, you can see the association here. You can see the association here. The direction is different, and you wouldn't get it there. It's not really all adipose that have those examples. This is just sort of <laughs> some of the ones that uh, I pulled together for the talk. Okay, but then there's some that we could say are possibly specific to one of the sexes. And so in this case, on the left panel, you've got the set that look like non-significant in males, but strongly significant in females. Um, and, you know, depending how big your sample size was, would you detect that in all? Maybe, but you wouldn't know that it was driven by the females, right? And, um, and same in this panel on the right. So this is a nerve one, very strong in males, not so much going on in females. Um, and you, you may have detected that in the all, but you wouldn't know that it was driven by the males. All right, so we can ask um, about how do these replicate across tissues? And um, this is just a really simplistic way of doing this, how I'm going to describe this today. This is not really um, the full-on story of how we will do this in the end, but if we're just sort of counting things up across here, we can say, okay, for example, you know, we had this set um, in one tissue, this set in the other tissue, how many overlap? And so you can see this matrix is pretty sparse, but we'll just summarize it pretty quickly right here and say that um, of the associations, these interactions we detect, interaction genes, how many of them come up in only one tissue? Um, you, you can see this distribution. There's not a lot of sharing across tissues. I can tell you with the bigger data set that we're looking at, the sharing has increased substantially. Um, and and um, so that gives us a little bit of confidence um, on the sort of false positive versus true positive rate. And our replication to other studies has also increased. So um, ex expect this space to change a little bit. So we can ask, what about a role for these in complex traits? So we did a very simple lookup of um, genetic variants reported in the NHGRI um, GWAS catalog. So this is just an updated weekly catalog of genetic associations to complex disease. And we just said, how many of them overlap the SNPs that we found here? And this is definitely not the full list whatsoever, but I'm just putting up some examples here. So in this top panel, you've got the tissue where, um, where the interaction was found, the EQTL interaction was found, and the GWAS traits that overlap those SNPs, um, and the gene that was regulated in the cis EQTLs. And so um, this is, I just you know, pulled out a couple examples to show people, but this one's a hormone receptor um, associated with serum levels which these kinds of questions, I think, are, or these kinds of examples are going to be interesting um, as we dissect this in more detail moving forward. So um, here's another one where the male signal is very strong, the female signal not at all, and, um, but you would have to pick it up in the combined sample. This is definitely one picked up. You can see the p-value for that one here in the combined sample. But now this is like a zoomed-in um, Manhattan plot. So this is really the region, and association strength is going up the axis here. And so you can really see in males, there is this big signal for that interaction association, and there's nothing in this region in the females at all. And so um, this particular association that's picked up in the regular EQTL analysis is definitely driven by one sex. All right. So um, to summarize, um, there's, in this analysis, about 200 significant SNP by sex interactions per tissue. And when I say interactions, I mean genes that have sex interactions. Um, and this appears unrelated to sample size. So the, the bigger samples don't necessarily have more. Um, and, and we'll see how that scales when, when we have essentially double the sample size of what I'm reporting here. Um, in this analysis, the X chromosome is not enriched for interactions. We'll see how that, how that plays out. Um, and not enriched for sex-related function, although there are some interesting examples in here. The distribution of these associations around the transcription start site is very different than for the regular cis -EQTLs. And our replication across tissues is low, but, but that's increasing, too, with sample size and power. 
Um, and, and definitely there's some overlap to GWAS signals that we will be looking at in, in a much more precise way um, using more sophisticated um, statistical genetics methodologies. And so I just want to um, say a couple things. So um, I lead the sex working group within the GTEx consortium. And so we are repeating all these analyses on significant significantly bigger data set, but there's many things going on in the GTEx working group related to sex. So just a description of um, differential expression, cross tissues, um, different isoform usage, exon usage, the genetic regulation of, of splicing and exon usage, um, sex differentiated networks within and between tissues. There's a ton of things going on in there, and many of the people in, in that group have received supplementary awards under these mechanisms to fund that research. And um, our papers are not out on that yet because it really required the bigger data sets. So we've sort of been spending um, the last few years developing methods for doing this the right way, and now we, we finally have the, the sample sizes big enough to put more definitive numbers on some of the things we've been seeing. So I sort of want to say, you know, watch this, watch this space <laughs> in a way. And um, just to, one last plug on the um, enhancing GTEx work, just to tell you what's coming down the pike on that, um, you can see these different types of data being collected, DNA methylation brain, DNA is one hypersensitive sites, um, bisulfite sequencing, somatic mutations, allele-specific expression, protein QTLs, um, targeted protein um, QTLs for transcription factors and cell signaling proteins. And, um, and there's a paper out about that in Nature Genetics um, right now, uh, just describing that. And um, finally, just the last piece on this is there, you know, I said there's a really nice portal. If you're interested in differential expression, you can just go and put your favorite gene in and also look at what's its expression um, in males and females across different tissues. This is updated all the time anytime there's a new release. So um, it's a really nice resource, and um, I encourage you to take a look there. And um, finally, there's, there's many, many people involved in work like this, but I just sort of put the biggest plug in for the analysts in my group that really did many of the work, much of the work that you see here, um, and would thank the GTEx donors and their families, the Common Fund, the Office for Women's Health Research, and the GTEx Consortium overall. And um, as I said, I've benefited a lot, this work and many others, um, with the uh, supplement awards. So... Thank you for your invitation, sorry, your attention and invitation. <laughs> so. so we can have a couple of questions. The last speaker runs over. Thanks for a great talk and introduction to this amazing uh, data set. And I appreciate what you were saying about the sample size limitations for now. But I was wondering if you represented the data as a matrix of SNPs by tissues. Yeah and each cell was the magnitude of the estimated sex by SNP interaction. Do you, do you get any information if you look at the data at that scale? So, that so are you saying, like, do, do tissues cluster or something like this? Exactly, yeah. Um, we haven't done that exactly. I'm guessing that um, at this scale... No, but, but maybe, maybe with, the, with our next version. I mean, certainly if you look at the differential expression or splicing or things like that, definitely there's, there's tissue clustering and tissue similarity metri metrics that, that make a lot of sense. Um, and, um, but whether the interaction piece of this is going to do that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It might be very tissue specific. And sex differences change across the lifespan. So yeah. is this all adults? Yeah, so, so these are all adults. Um, and um, I, I pulled the slide out that had the distribution. Um, mostly it's older people who are dying in the hospital. Um, but there, and, and actually there's, there's a little bit of sex bias in the causes of death. Um, as well, and, the, and there are some younger individuals in here that are, and they're all over 18, but it's pretty bimodal with probably about 80% older people dying in the hospital, and then some young people who are accident victims, predominantly male. Um, we have all, mostly postmenopausal women. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you so much for Thanks. all the speakers. So now we will have a break. So we will have a little break and then we will come back at 10.15. Thank you.